If you would have asked me last year what put London, Ontario onto the global stage, I may have said our university, our healthcare system, or even our gardens. But I never would have imagined that our city would be talked about in Beijing and Washington because of hate, racism, and terror that came to us on June 6th. We'll begin with breaking news and what the mayor of London, Ontario is calling an unspeakable act of hatred. Police down by a driver who was acting out of hatred for Muslims. A family of five were out walking when a car jumped a curb. At high speed into a Muslim family who were out for a Sunday evening walk. We believe the victims were targeted because of their Islamic faith, that this was an intentional act. This crowd has really been growing by the minute here tonight. At one point, people were lining both sides of this the street. The National Council of Canadian Muslims says this is another example of Islamophobia. Uh, they are calling this a terror attack and asking it to be treated as such. Remember when you wanted to put on the hijab, but you were afraid something bad was going to happen to you? Remember when we were afraid too? And we can't just continue as if nothing has happened. There have been so many lives lost and people are frustrated. Remember after the Quebec massacre, they promised us that it wouldn't happen again? They told us we shouldn't be afraid. They told us we were safe. They told us things would change. But they didn't. One of the things that I heard the most in the weeks following the attack, whether at work or at school, was the sentence, I don't understand how this happened. And while I understand the intention behind that statement, it's also really frustrating to hear because as Muslims, we experience Islamophobia every single day. And 42% of Canadians believe that we deserve it. So we know exactly how this happened. Islamophobia comes in all different forms. Some might seem lesser than others, but it's important that people understand that smaller forms of Islamophobia are not disconnected from larger ones. Each moment of Islamophobia is intertwined with one another. The snide comments cannot be separated from the violent hate. So last summer, I was playing basketball with my two Muslim friends at the park. And a woman came up to us and started complimenting us and saying that we are beautiful and powerful and that she loves seeing us play basketball at our age. I thought it was a really sweet conversation until she started saying that since we are in Canada, we can now be free, that we don't have to wear the hijab or be oppressed anymore. And she even gestured with her hands for us to remove the hijab. We smiled, brushed off her comments, and stood in the middle of the court wondering why we couldn't just play basketball without our identities being questioned why we have to justify who we are, and why we have to keep putting up with the hate, prejudice, and the stereotypes. She couldn't fathom that maybe we were born in Canada, that we are free, and that we are strong enough to make our own choices. Wearing the hijab is my choice for anyone who doubts it. Even our institutions face discrimination. When we were renting a space to open a local mosque, <laughs> There was an existing agreement between the landlord and the nearby church to use their parking lot when needed. But once the mosque opened, the church refused to allow worshippers to park there. The mosque offered to pay and even brought gifts as a gesture of good faith, and yet both were rejected. No one could understand why the church wouldn't allow another faith group to park there on a Friday when the parking lot's empty, since they had allowed others to park there previously. Eventually, a senior member of the church came out and mentioned that the reason they did not want us to park there was because they did not like how we looked with our long beards and dresses and women with their head coverings. He said he didn't like how Muslims came to Canada to change it and to take advantage of it. For that man, it's clear that he didn't believe that we belong, not as Canadians, not as community members, not even as neighbors. Three days after Yomna and her family were run over, my mother and I had just left the mosque when two women in another vehicle pointed and laughed at us as they veered towards our car and attempted to run us off the road. When I pulled out my phone to videotape them, they sped off quickly. We called the police, but our complaints fell on deaf ears. 
My mother was asked, well, did they actually hit you? What would you like us to do? It's as if violence is only physical. It's as if a family wasn't just run over in the streets of London, Ontario, because they were Muslim. It's as if this couldn't happen again. My mother had to insist that the police officer speak with the women. You have to wonder how many others just give up or never make the call at all out of fear of not being believed, taken seriously, or even heard. Hate crimes go unreported for this very reason. But if we don't have an accurate snapshot of the hate in our communities, how will we ever address it? The hatred that killed Yomna didn't happen in a vacuum. It's the same hatred that Muslims experience on a daily basis, just not as violent. Yumna was my dear friend, and this is what I had to deal with after losing her in such a horrific way. We weren't even allowed to process this tragedy. We weren't even allowed to grieve in peace. Each of these instances of Islamophobia is related to one another. What happened to Nawal is not separate from what happened to our mosque, is not separate from what happened to Maryam, and is not separate from what happened to Yumna. Islamophobia happens anywhere, everywhere, and anytime. While we're playing basketball, looking for extra parking, grieving a loved one, or even while we're going for a walk, the result is a community that continues to be traumatized. We are exhausted. It's a never-ending battle that we can never completely heal from. The thing about family is that you're just always there for each other, and throughout this year, I have never needed them more. I lost an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a friend. They were my only other family in London, and I always felt their love and support when I was with them. Losing them meant, for the first time in 14 years, losing the ability to rely on my family. I miss our family dinners. I miss how Yumna and my Aunt Madiha would decorate my hands with henna every Eid. I miss our family traditions. I cherish the memories of my aunt and uncle's loving nature. The way they made my brothers and I feel as if we were their own children, always making sure that we left their house with our bellies full and hearts a little warmer. Being the only other girl in my family, I saw Yumna like the little sister I never had. Losing her isn't just a loss for me and those who knew her, but for everyone, because she had so much potential and a lifetime ahead of her to change the world. This same world that let her down in the end. She had a dream of leaving a legacy, and now the whole world will forever remember the inspiring, caring, and special person that she was. Our sister Yumna, her father, her mother, her grandmother, were extinguished in a moment of intentional hate. This left us with a community trying to heal from very real fears. The fear of being different. The fear of isolation. The fear of walking down the street with your family. The fear of women looking too Muslim. The fear of being targeted by hate. And we have other families too that walk these sidewalks and it could have been us. That's what I keep thinking, it could have been us. These acts have consequences. They narrow space. They narrow the communal spaces we share. They diminish the space on our roads, in our schools, in our places of worship. They take up space in our minds and in our hearts. Space that should be filled with peace and happiness. Space that has left so many of us feeling so alone. We are here to take back those spaces. For our community, for ourselves, for Yumna. We are sorry that our world failed you. So our promise to you, Yumna, is we will dry our eyes and raise our voices until everyone hears us. We started YCCI as a youth-led organization to combat Islamophobia and to honor our friend. Join us in keeping our promise to Yumna. Do your part and take initiative. I will challenge all forms of hate. I will ask the world to open their eyes, but more importantly, to open their hearts. I will continue wearing my hijab with pride. I am going to make sure that Yumna's legacy lives on. We're doing our part. We hope that you'll do yours.